Good morning and welcome to North Lake Baptist Church. Hope you're having a wonderful morning and that you've had a great week. Guests, we want to thank you for coming and worshiping with us this morning. Uh, we do have gift bags uh, there at the door uh, on your way out. Uh, please uh, uh, help yourself to one. Uh, there's a visitor's card in there uh, where you could call or uh, you could um, get to us next Sunday or um, call us. We'd love to know you were or with us this morning uh, at, at worship. Uh, thank you for joining us online. If you're joining us online, just feel free to leave us a comment where you're joining us from, and we'd love to get back with you and, and reply to your comment. Church, I hope you've had a wonderful week. Uh, your mission team has had a great week, and we are good tired. Have you ever been good tired? Well, we are good tired. Our, our heart is full coming back from West Virginia. It was a wonderful week of ministry uh, there at Lock Galley Baptist Church and Minden Missionary Baptist Church. And uh, we are, uh, Brother Danny and I will be talking this week about how we're going to do our mission trip report. So uh, uh, be uh, looking forward to that in the days to come. We've got a couple of announcements that we need to uh, uh, go over at this time. Our ministry placement team will be meeting uh, following the service in room 112. Is that next Sunday? Okay, so our ministry placement team will meet next Sunday, not this Sunday, but next Sunday. Uh, children, uh, your Sunday school Zoom is on at 2 o'clock this afternoon. And high school and middle school students, uh, this evening we're going to be uh, getting together in the backyard here and we're going to play some kickball and have some hot dogs and uh, so hope you'll join us this afternoon to play some kickball uh, at this time church i'd like to give you an update and as we worship through our tithes and offerings uh, we've had some uh, workers on our roof uh, the past couple of weeks and we've gotten our uh, new sanctuary roof on and there's some uh, great news uh, you know there were with the age of our roof, we were wondering uh, if we would have to replace some decking underneath uh, the roof once they got it torn off. Well, the Lord has just blessed us, and we didn't have to replace any decking. And so we're going to see a cost savings, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll see a, a substantial cost savings in our uh, sanctuary roof install. They're still working on the gutters to get those done, but that is a wonderful blessing that the Lord has given us. Uh, church, as a mission team, we do want to thank you for sponsoring us as a mission team and faithfully giving. And so as you give, uh, we just thank you for allowing ministry uh, to go to uh, flourish here at North Lake. So I'd like to uh, give our Vacation Bible School memory verse uh, as we get started in worship. It comes, its address, as I like to say to the children, it's found in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians 1, 6. What an encouraging passage, uh, verse of scripture that we have there. Church, will you join me as I pray? Almighty, most holy God, Lord, we thank you for a beautiful day that we could come and gather together for worship. Lord, we pray today, Philippians 1, 6. Lord, we're confident that you can begin a work in somebody's heart today. Lord, we pray that salvation would come to someone today in this worship service. Lord, we pray today that as we worship, that those who are believers will be strengthened, will know that, Lord, you don't take a day off. Lord, you don't get tired, but you continue to work each and every day in our lives. And Lord, we are thankful and we look forward to as watchmen to the day that Christ Jesus will come again and take us home to be with you. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship once again. And it's in Jesus' strong and powerful name that we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Let's stand together this morning. Let's start our service off by singing, We have heard that joyful sound. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the mountains, cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout it brightly to the gloom. With the heart for mercy craves. Sing and triumph o'er the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. What great words of hope and encouragement this morning. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Despite what's going on in your life and where you are at this moment, there is never an opportunity, as long as you still have breath, that is too late call upon the power that is found in Jesus name to call upon salvation that can only come from him he is the way the truth and the life and no man can come to the father except through Christ Jesus uh, saves this morning let's continue singing that as our theme <laughs> heaven beating Jesus saves Jesus saves and the hush of mercy breathing Jesus saves Jesus saves hear the host of angels sing glory to the newborn king and the sound of joy repeating Jesus saves. See the humblest hearts adore him. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, and the wisest bow before him. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. See the sky alive with praise, melting darkness in its place. saves he will live our sorrow sharing Jesus saves Jesus saves he will die our burden bearing Jesus saves Jesus saves it is done we'll shout the cross Christ has paid redemption's cost while the empty tombs declaring Jesus saves freedom's calling chains are falling hope is dawning bright and true day is breaking night is quaking God is making all things new freedom's calling chains are falling Jesus saves, rising up so vast and 
strong, lifting up salvation song. The redeemed will sing forever. Jesus saves, rising up so vast and strong, lifting up salvation song. The redeemed. So welcome to the house of the Lord this morning. So good to see you here today. And it's so good to hear you sing praises to our Lord. If you have your bulletin, look at the back page and we'll look at our prayer list. Our verse comes from Psalm 50 today. Call upon me in the day of trouble, says the Lord, and I will deliver you and then you shall glorify me. Are we living in days of trouble? Yes. Okay, so call out to the Lord. He will save us. And then it's our turn to turn around and praise and glorify him. We do praise the Lord for the great West Virginia mission trip that happened this past week. I understand there were three professions of faith. Uh, the word was, was sown, and also uh, a lot of people were encouraged uh, as they went on the trip this week. Uh, Mildred Boykin uh, turned 90 this past week, 90 years young, so we praise the Lord for that. Billy King and also we'll add Tom Johnson uh, were able to go home from the hospital, so we uh, again praise the Lord. Uh, continue to remember those in your circle of influence and pray and ask the Lord if he would give you an opportunity to share your faith with them and lead them to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, you see our church family listed there. We've got a few we need to add. Uh, one of our youngsters, uh, Rebecca Britt, uh, spent the yesterday evening at uh, Children's Hospital of Atlanta following a bee sting, uh, but uh, she was able to go home, so we, we're thankful for that. Uh, Francis Steedley is going to be having a, a ear surgery, ear procedure this next uh, Wednesday. And also Sarah Lynn Williams is going to be having some tests on Tuesday. So be in prayer for her. Uh, remember our parents are expecting uh, children, extended family and friends. You see our long list under long-term care. And I just wanted to highlight uh, Vicki Wingo's mom, Miss Christine uh, Odom. Um, is on hospice and they got some difficult things they've got to work through so be praying uh, for Miss Christine and Vicki and the family also I want to remember our missionaries serving around the world today the International Mission Board has asked us to remember um, those in South Africa particularly the remote areas I know we're thinking about what we're having to go through with the coronavirus but uh, they're having the same problems all around the world and in this case we got uh, seminary students uh, young men in learning uh, preparing to go into ministry and uh, the universities have closed so they're going back to where they're from and they don't all have Wi-Fi and so our missionaries are trying to get materials to them and keep them encouraged and keep them from feeling isolated as well so uh, let's pray for our missionaries as they have to deal with what we're do dealing with uh, with less technology uh, to help them. Also remember to pray for our nation and our president and those who are still trying to fight this battle that we find ourselves in. Uh, as we go, the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this day that you've blessed us with, a beautiful summer day. Thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters who are able to gather in person here and worship you today, and also those who are uh, joining online and watching. I pray, Lord, that uh, you hear all of our prayers as we lift them up before you. Uh, we have a long prayer list, but we're thankful, Lord, that you're an almighty God, fully capable of answering our prayers according to your goodwill and purpose. We do pray. We just sung about salvation. We pray that today would be the day of salvation for somebody who does not yet know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And Lord, we pray that that would happen today. And for those of us who already know you as Savior, that today we'd be encouraged in our faith and that we would, in fact, return and give glory to you for all that you do in and through us. And we'll pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you know life can be unpredictable? Right? Here lately, 
Uh, specifically over the past few months, life has been very unpredictable for each and every one of us in a different way. And it may not surprise or, or shock any of you to know that life is unpredictable for many people and has been since the beginning of time. We're not the first group of people who have gone through tragedy, gone through sadness, gone through all levels of emotion, uh, of unpredictability. But there is a continuous constant of Christ and the hope that can be found in Him. Nothing is um, probably more touching as some of the stories that are behind the hymns that we sing. And some of you may have heard this story before, but I think it's very... Uh, uh, apropos for uh, today's time and where we are and looking at the hope that only Christ can bring to talk about the song, It Is Well With My Soul. Uh, Terry sung this a few months ago uh, and uh, did a fantastic job in honoring the Lord through that. Today I want all of us to sing it and we'll do so in a moment just before Brother Danny comes to speak. But it speaks very closely to how God can work through all circumstances. And if you don't know the story, uh, the words were penned by a gentleman by the name of Horatio Spafford. Now, Horatio was an attorney and a real estate broker in Chicago. And things got pretty rough at the end of Chicago, uh, particularly around 1871, when the fire of Chicago came and burned down most of the city the great Chicago fire of 1871, um, and he lost almost everything as a part of that fire. So he felt like, you know what, I need to just step away, I need to get away, and so we're gonna, I'm going to send my family over, we're going to take a trip to, to Europe. And so while he was finishing a few things, he sent his wife and his four daughters on a trip to Europe, which he would meet them uh, a few days later. And so they got on a boat and they boarded a ship headed over to England for vacation. While his wife and four daughters were on board that ship, the ship was in a terrible collision in the middle of the ocean and it sank. 200 people died aboard that particular ship and all four of Horatio's daughters died during that trip. His wife alone was the only one who survived during that point in time. So now Horatio has lost almost all of his real estate and attorney business that he had. He's now lost his four daughters. His wife gets to England, and she sends him a wire. Ship sank. Daughters lost. I alone survived. What shall I do? Well, he immediately jumped on board a ship, and he decided to go ahead and, and head on to support his wife and, and see what happened. And the Lord was working in Horatio's Part in life as Horatio was just calling out to God, what, what can I do? What, what comfort is there? What hope is there? And as the ship began to sail across the Atlantic, Horatio began to think about his daughters. And he found comfort and hope. And he penned these words as a part of that. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, sorrow upon sorrow upon sorrow, whatever my lot, you have taught me or thou hast taught me to say or to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. Horatio knew the fact that there is no hope found in this world. There is no peace found in this world. But beyond this world, in eternity, the only place there will be everlasting peace, everlasting hope, is when we put that hope in Jesus Christ. This morning, I would challenge you, if you don't know him as Lord and Savior, to think through that so that you can also sing these words, it is well with my soul. Let's stand together uh, just before Brother Danny comes and let's sing this great hymn, it is well with my soul. Oh, 
say it is well it is well with my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul my sin seated. I think you can give yourself a bigger hand than that. Yeah. Amen. Act like it is well with your soul. If you have your Bibles, please open to Revelation. The Revelation chapter 5. We continue our study through uh, this great book, the final book of the scriptures. Revelation chapter 5, I'll begin reading in verse 1. If you'll leave your Bibles open, we'll uh, finish it up throughout the sermon, but we'll read the first uh, seven. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at all. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, the Four living creatures in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits, or the sevenfold spirit of God, sent out to all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. As we begin chapter 5, uh, John is still in the spirit, uh, having visions of heaven. He's being given a tour of heaven. He's in the throne room of God um, in the midst of a worship service. 
And his attention, if you remember, has been drawn to the throne where God the Father sits. And in chapter 4 that we looked at last time, God the Father was so surrounded by brilliant, radiant color and light that John couldn't see any features of God except for the Shekinah, except for the glory of God. But now, John's being allowed to see the right hand. And the right hand is holding a scroll filled uh, and rolled up with, and sealed with the seven seals. But the question is, what is it? What, what is this scroll? And what does it mean? Now, many scholars, again, there's many opinions as there are commentaries. You read different commentaries. One says they think it's a will. Another says they think it's the book of the new covenant. Some think it is the book of judgment. Some think it is the revelation of God's eternal purpose concerning this world. Uh, some said they believe it's Ezekiel's scroll from the Old Testament, the scroll of woe in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9. Some say they believe it's Daniel's sealed prophecy, uh, Daniel chapter 12 uh, and verse 4. One of the most bizarre attempts to try to explain the scroll with the seven seals happened in 1993 at a cult compound near Waco, Texas. There was a religious group known as the Branch Davidians. Branch Davidians were a splinter group out of the Seventh-day Adventist church. They were led by a man named Vernon Howell, also known as David Koresh. He believed he was Christ on earth. He believed he was the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, the Root of David, spoken of in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5. He thought his job was to gather a small group of purified believers, open those seven seals, which would bring about the fall of Babylon, the battle of Armageddon, the return of Christ and the establishment of the kingdom of David. In order to prepare and purify this group to be ready for the end of the world, they had to give up all their possessions. All of their money was used by the group to buy weapons. When it was all sorted out, they owned about 11 tons of weapons. They had to give up their families. All marriages were dissolved. All branch Davidians were to live celibate lives, except for David Koresh, and his, that word, David Koresh and his spiritual wives, of course his spiritual wives were the wives of the other guys who had to give up their wives, and that included all the females in the compound, some as young as 12 years old. This huge stockpile of weapons eventually drew the attention of the FBI and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. They came to serve a warrant on David Koresh, and he refused to surrender because he said he was waiting on God to give him instructions on how to break the seven seals. Then came April 19th, 1993. After a 50-day standoff, law enforcement stormed the compound with tanks. There was a fire. Nobody knows for sure who started the fire, whether it was law enforcement or folks on the inside. It's still a debate. But David Koresh and 75 of his followers perished. 21 of them were children. I don't believe that David Koresh figured out uh, the seals uh, on the seven, uh, the seven seals on the scroll. I believe that Revelation chapter 5 and the scroll, seven seals, has a more biblical explanation with David Koresh. The interpretation that makes the most sense to me uh, was offered by Dr. Harry Ironside, uh, pastor of Chicago's Moody Church. Uh, back in the 1930s, 1940s. And he said the scroll with the seven seals is the title deed to the world. He said it represents our right to the Garden of Eden, to paradise, to heaven. It represents all that was lost in the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. The key to this interpretation is in verse 9. If you underline things in your Bible, underline the word redeemed. If it says redeemed, some of them say ransomed depending on your translation. But underline the word redeemed. It says a new song based on the prayers of the saints is offered to Jesus, for he has redeemed us to God by his blood. Well, what does it mean when it says Jesus is our redeemer? Well, redeem means to buy back something that was lost. Again, this is one of those deals where if you hadn't read the rest of the book, it's hard to get a hold of what's going on in Revelation here. Uh, the law of redemption uh, goes all the way back to one of your favorite books, Leviticus. How many of you have read Leviticus lately? Yeah, Leviticus chapter 25 gives us the laws of redemption. 
And of course, it's more fun to read examples of how redemption works than it is to read the law. And redemption stories can be found in the story of Ruth in the Old Testament and also in Jeremiah chapter 32. But anyhow, the way it generally works is if a person for some reason lost his land, wasn't able to afford it anymore, maybe fell on hard times, maybe he had illness, uh, maybe he had fire came and burned everything out, who knows. But if he lost it uh, and it could trans he could, somebody else could purchase it or take it from him, he went before the judges and they made a scroll, a document was prepared and it had really three parts to it. One of them stated uh, who the land was passing to. It had the name of the new owner. Uh, the second part of it was the uh, terms of the price of redemption. In other words, how much was a land worth? How much would it cost in order to get the land back? And the third part of it is it was then sealed and placed in the temple uh, for future reference. Now, there's two ways that you could go about getting your land back. First of all, you could buy it back yourself. If somehow or another you came into money and could afford to pay the redemption price and you could go back and pay it because it technically was yours because it came down through the generations to your family so you could buy it back to the guy who bought it from you. Rarely did that happen. Another way that you could get your land back was by a near kinsman or a close relative, uh, some rich uncle could come and redeem the land by taking the title deed, breaking the seals on it, opening it up, paying the redemption price, and then he could give the land back to you and you could start all over again. That was what we call the law of redemption. Now, in order to have a kinsman redeemer being able to help you do that, first of all, he had to be qualified. So you'd have to make sure that uh, everybody understood that he was near kin, he was a close relative to the debtor who lost the land. Uh, next, he had to be financially able. So he had to be qualified, able to buy back the land. He had to have the money in order to buy it back. And the third part of it is he had to be willing to redeem. In other words, you may have a rich uncle with a lot of money, but he may not want to give it to you. So he had to be willing uh, to, to uh, do this transaction for you. And so this Old Testament uh, redemption law didn't make much sense as you're reading through the Old Testament. But once you get to Revelation, all of a sudden it begins to make sense. This is the salvation story uh, of the Bible. It begins all the way back in Genesis 1. We're going to preach from Genesis to Revelation today, so just prepare yourself. Now, we're going all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, where you see God created a good earth, not just good, but very good. Then he created Adam and gave the earth to him to manage. And then if you remember, the time we get to Genesis 3, Adam, the original human, representing all of humanity it's what theologians call federal headship anyway he got involved in a deal with the devil and if you remember he ended up sinning against god and he lost everything not just for himself but since he is the federal head of all humanity he lost it for all of us first corinthians chapter 15 verse 22 it says in adam all die in other words whatever happened to adam happened to all of his descendants down uh, through all of our family trees Adam lost his right to eternal life, to fellowship with God, to the Garden of Eden, to paradise, and this title deed for the earth transferred back to God. And of course, the price to redemption for sin and God was what? Death. Yeah, it's very steep. Most people can't afford, how many of you can afford to die more than once? So that's the problem. It's an insurmountable debt that none of us could pay. Matter of fact, Genesis 2.17 before God turned Adam and Eve loose in the garden. Remember, he said, there's this tree out there called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you of it you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, what? You shall surely die. Yeah. Later on in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 18, 4, the soul that sins shall die. Transfer it on to the New Testament. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. So then this title deed to Eden, paradise, heaven was all sealed up and placed in God's temple in heaven. And mankind existed as slaves under the domination of a new cruel landlord named Satan. And all of us begin serving our sentence of sin, sorrow, and death. And not only was mankind suffering, but the Bible tells us the whole creation suffered under the curse that came about because of Adam. In Romans chapter 8, verse 19, it says, For the earnest expectation of the whole creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. 
For the creation was subject to futility or worthlessness, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, because this creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So one of the reasons that the earth is messed up today, I think, you know, we hear these environmentalist wackos all the time talking about how messed up our environment is. Yeah, but they don't have the solution for it. It's been messed up because of sin. And the only way that we can get it back is we need somebody to come and buy it back to redeem what we lost. So not only do we as human beings need a savior, need a kinsman redeemer, the whole creation, our environment is hoping for one. So even the animals you see out there, they might not be able to talk to you, but if you could talk to them, they can hardly wait to see the earth redeemed uh, with the coming of the Son of God who makes all things new. So if you look back now to chapter 5 and verse 2, you'll see a call went out for a kinsman redeemer to buy back our heavenly inheritance. The angel called out and said, Who is worthy to open the scroll and lose its seals? Anybody, anybody out there qualified? Anybody willing and able to come and buy back humanity from what we lost in Adam? Was there anyone who was kin who would be able to do that? Uh, to pay the, for the wages, the price, the consequences of our sin? And then if you look in chapter 5, verse 3, you got some sad news. Who was qualified? No one. Anywhere. In heaven or in earth or below the earth already died. Nobody was found worthy that was qualified to be our redeemer. You know, the Bible describes for us Moses. Moses was the greatest lawyer who ever lived. Matter of fact, until things started being overtaken by communists in our country, the Mosaic law was the basis of the law in our land. And for many uh, of the Western countries through the world. So Moses is the greatest lawyer, but you know, he couldn't even keep God's commandments. If you remember, he was a murderer, so he was disqualified. Samuel was the best of all the judges. How many of you remember reading through the judges in the Old Testament? Those were some hard times. There's a few bright spots, but most of them not so bright. But among the best of the best was Samuel, but Samuel couldn't control his own family. As a matter of fact, uh, that's why they said they needed a king is because Samuel's sons were evil. So therefore, the best of the judges was disqualified. If you remember, Samson was the strongest man. But what was his problem? Even though he had strong bodily strength, he had weak morals. And so he couldn't even control himself. Therefore, he was disqualified. He couldn't stand up for us. David was the greatest king, but he couldn't reign over his own lust. Therefore, he was disqualified. Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived, but in his search for more wisdom, he got himself all entangled with immorality and with worldly idolatry, and he was, he was disqualified. He also couldn't redeem us. So great as all these men were, none were great enough. None of them were perfect. All humans sin and fall short of God's holy standard. All are disqualified. The soul that sins, so that means no one was good enough. Nobody was perfect enough in order to be our kinsman redeemer. Well, what about the angels? The Bible says, if you read on over ahead of me in chapter 5 a little bit, there's uh, 10,000 times 10,000 of angels. Surely one of them would be able to redeem us. Well, they might be able and they might be willing, but the problem is they're not qualified. They are not near kin to us. They are not close relatives. Angels are spiritual beings. They're not flesh and blood like you and I. So therefore, they're disqualified. So look on down to verse 4. You leave John, it said he wept much. He kept on crying. No one was found worthy to redeem us. Kind of reminds me of a southern gospel. Why is it everything reminds me of a southern gospel song? But anyway, it was written in 1948 by a guy named Marvin Dalton. He said, once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. But what? They searched through heaven and found a savior to save a poor, lost soul like me. Y'all picked up on the song? Oh, what a savior. You want me to do that? <laughs> oh, hallelujah. His heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nail scarred. His side was riven or torn apart. He gave his life blood for even me. And that brings us to the good news. Verses five through seven. There's the good news. It turns out that there was a sacrificial lamb that was found who was qualified, willing, and able to redeem us, to save us from our slavery to Satan, to sin, to sorrow, to death. Well, the question is, who is this lamb? 
Well, John had already told us about that earlier, not in the Revelation right here, but earlier in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 1, verse 29, if you remember, it says John the Baptist was baptizing people down at the Jordan River, trying to prepare them for the coming of the Messiah. And one day he said he saw Jesus coming. And what did he say? Did he say, hello, cousin Jesus, even though he was cousin? What did he say? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's our lamb right there, the sacrificial lamb. So Jesus is the lamb who had been slain. He was the one that was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was the lion of the tribe of Judah. He was of the root or descendant of David. So there we have him. So heaven had to vet Jesus and make sure that he sure enough was qualified and willing and able. And let's look at that. Was he a near kinsman? And the answer is yes, at Bethlehem. God became one of us in the person of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, if you remember, the angel said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and, they shall, uh, and bear a son, and they shall call his name, what? Emmanuel, which means God with us. So yes, he came down so he could be related to us, so that he could redeem us. John says it a different way in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then you skip on down to verse 14. That word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children of men have partaken of flesh and blood, Jesus himself did likewise, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil, and release those of us who through fear of death were all of our lifetime subject to bondage or the slavery of sin. For indeed, he does not give his aid to angels, but he gives his aid to the children of Abraham. So yeah, that's why Jesus did what he did. That's why he came down and become one of us is so that he could save us, so that he could redeem us, so that he could be our kinsman redeemer. So Jesus was our kinsman. He put on skin. He put on flesh and blood so he could become one of us. Therefore, he is qualified. Now, the second question was, was he able? How many of you think that he was able? Yes, he was able. Uh, Hebrews 4.15, Jesus was in all points tempted just as we are except for one thing, what? Without sin. He didn't sin. We're all tempted, and we ultimately fall in various ways. Uh, but he said, therefore, we can come boldly to the throne of grace and find help in our time of need because of who Jesus is, is he is the sinless son of God. But you got to remember the wages of our sin is what? Death. So how could he pay for us? Well, first of all, he had to die for us. Look back to chapter 5, verse 6, and says he was a lamb as though it had been slain. Chapter 5 and verse 9, redeemed us to God by his blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Right. Hebrews 9.22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So Jesus was qualified. He was kin to us in the flesh. And he was also able. He was a perfect substitute sacrifice to die for us. But the third point is, would he be willing? How many of you think Jesus knew what he's getting himself into when he decided to come down from his glory? to become one of us. So yes, he was willing. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved, he gave. He willingly gave. You know, in earlier times, that would have been enough. In earlier times, we would have had a good enough understanding of the Trinity uh, that would have caused us to understand that when the Bible says God the Father so loved the world he gave his only begotten son it also means God the Son so loved the world that he gave himself I mean we would have understood that that would have been part of our Trinitarian doctrine but you know these days with so many so called Christian authors out there writing ridiculous things because they must publish or perish how many of you ever heard that before bear that in mind when you're reading new books out there now is you got to come up with some new thing in order to sell a book so anyway, one of those guys, a fellow named William P. Young, who wrote the two million best-selling book called The Shack. I'm not going to ask you if you've read The Shack. If you have, shame on you. But anyway, uh, he also uh, wrote about the cross of Christ in another book called Lives, Lies We Believe About God, where he offers the following. 
He said, if God originated the idea of the cross, then it is divine child abuse. Like I said, these guys have to publish, and he's also going to perish. But anyway, uh, but now let me, let me quickly clarify something for you. The cross of Christ was not divine child abuse. Jesus was not forced by his heavenly Father to go to the cross. But because of his great love, Jesus willingly, voluntarily went to the cross. Titus 2.13, Paul tells us about our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people who were zealous of good works. Another mind-blowing verse, just a part of the verse blows my mind, 2 Corinthians 5.19. Do you realize at the cross that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself? Now, if somebody can figure that one out, tell me about it after church is over. How can God be in Christ he's sending his son into the world but at the same time he's sending himself into the world it's that whole Trinitarian thing that I can't get a hold on I just believe it because God's word says so don't ask me to explain all that I can't comprehend how God was in Christ yet when Christ died God did not die and he was the resurrection power that brought him up from the grave so that you and I could be saved I don't know about y'all, but that's almost a hallelujah right there. Another incomparable thing is while we were yet sinners, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit were united in their love and commitment to die for our sins so that we could be redeemed and restored into a relationship with the God who made us. Now, all I know to say is praise the Lord on that. I don't know if I would have done Would you have done that? If you'd created something... Gave them the freedom to love you, and they didn't love you. They went off and did things on their own. What would you do? If I'd had as big a hand as God, I think I would have thumped that marble in the far reaches of the universe and started all over. But instead, he loved us so much that he'd come up with this plan of redemption where he'd come down and be one of us, show us how to live, go to the cross and die for our sins, and rise again, offering us an opportunity to be with him forever. That's, a, that's love right there. Remember at the Garden of Gethsemane before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. So it's obvious that as a flesh and blood man, Jesus dreaded the shame and blame of the cross. But earlier... Jesus had explained his mission, the mission that he willingly volunteered for. In John 6, 38, he said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Who was him who sent? Well, his heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit and himself made that decision before he came down. So redemption was Jesus' will. It was his desire. It was his purpose. So in Jesus Christ... We have, according to verse 4 and 5 here, someone who is worthy to redeem us. He is qualified. He is our next of kin. He is our close relative. He is a flesh and blood human being, just like you and I. And he is able. He is the sinless son of God. He didn't have to die for his own sin, which qualified him to die for our sin. That's the problem you and I have, is we can't die for somebody else. Why? Because we've got to die for ourselves because of our own sin. But Jesus, being sinless, was able to die for all of us. Why? Because he was the sinless Son of God. 1 Timothy 1.12, Paul testifies. And I think this one was set to music too, Brother Derek. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. You notice in there? Somewhere it said he is able in the middle of that verse. He is able. He is able. He is also willing. Hebrews 10, 7, I have come to do thy will, O Lord, was the testimony of our Lord. And so in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, we have a new song, and it's a joyful song. It's a song that goes kind of like Psalm 30. Jesus has turned our weeping into joy. Weeping may endure for a night, but what? Joy comes in the morning. Now let's uh, pick up that new song. We've Start down there in verse 8. Now, when he had taken the scroll, 
The four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, and this incense represented the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song based on these prayers of the saints. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Notice a new song is being sung here. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to redeem us, to save us from our sins. It's a new song, but I, it kind of reminds me of an old song too. It goes back to Isaiah chapter 51, 11, and it was actually turned into a praise song. They didn't add anything to it. They just pulled it out of Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 11, turned it into a praise course back in the 70s. How many of you remember the 70s? How many of you were in church in the 70s? A lot of people weren't in church in the 70s, but there were some good songs. This one here comes from Isaiah. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing into Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. Remember that? You sung that about a half a dozen times. And then you went to a bridge. And the bridge also came from Isaiah. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come a-singing into Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. Y'all want to sing with me about a half a dozen times? No. But anyway, that, that's, the, that's the new song that you're going to be singing, a redemption song right there. These redeemed are the people of God from all the ages in both Old Testament and New Testament. Verse 9, it says, They're out of every tribe, all the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, and also every tongue and people and nation. I love the Greek word for nation. The Greek word for nation is ethnos. What do you think we get out of that word? Every ethnic group all around the world. Somehow or another, if we could get a hold of that concept right there, I think that would solve our racial problems. I think it would solve our social justice problems if we realize that he came to redeem all of us from whatever part of the country, whatever part of the world we're from, he came to be our redeemer. And the song continues, verse 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them, talking about the angels, was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying the loud, with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in the heaven and on the earth and under the earth which are uh, in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessed and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Again, all creation is crying out for this time when the children of men, the children of God, will be redeemed because then the whole world will have the curse removed and it'll go back to being the paradise that God intended for it to be. And then the four living creatures said, Amen. And all the people said, all right, and I think they said it louder in heaven, but anyway. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. You know, we often sing redemption songs, but do we really know what we're singing? Do you ever think about what you're singing about? I hope we do, because that's part of the worship experience. It's not just singing things in tune, but actually listening to what we're singing and offering those praises to the Lord. We're still using hymn books, which we hadn't used in the last few months because of all that's going on, but 544, it's redeemed how I'd left to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child, and forever I am. Uh, 575, sing, O oh, sing of my Redeemer. With His blood, He purchased me on the cross, he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. And then one that we don't think about as a redemption song, but it's right there in the middle of it, is hymn number 426. O victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. Right. He loved me air. We don't use, how many of you use air anymore? <laughs> he loved me before I ever knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath that cleansing flow. Oh, the blood of Jesus. So now when we sing redemption songs, always think about that. Say, oh yeah, that's Revelation chapter 5 we're talking about here. The scroll with the seven seals. It was a scroll that spelled out our destiny on the outside. 
It was a sad thing. On the outside, it was written, Paradise Lost by Adam. Is it just Adam? Or is it Adam's children, too? I need to preach my sermon from Romans called, Oh, Adam, again. It's because we somehow get up the idea that it's Adam and Eve's problem. No, given the same circumstances, we find ourselves committing the same sins. So on the outside, it says paradise lost. But once you crack open those seals, open it up, and on the inside, it says paradise can be regained or redeemed by the death of a sinless substitute sacrifice by the Lamb of God that takes away the sins if we'll only put our faith and trust in him. Jesus became that man. Jesus was the kinsman who was qualified, willing, and able to pay our sin debt and buy back our right to heaven. And that, brothers and sisters, is what we call redemption. Next time, we'll be moving on to chapter 6, if y'all want to read ahead of me. And we'll see what in the world happens whenever the Lamb begins to crack open those seals to take back the world from the power of Satan and restore our relationship with our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and friend. We're coming to a time of invitation. Revelation chapter 5 here shows us what great pains the Lord suffered in order that you and I could be redeemed. And the question we'll be asking ourselves as we go there is, have you repented of your sins? Have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? If not, why don't you do it today? Why don't you do it now while there's time? Maybe you're saved, but you've never been baptized and never joined the church. Won't you do that while it's still called today? Maybe you've been saved and baptized and your church membership somewhere else. You feel like the Lord is leading you to come and join this fellowship and find your place of service here. Won't you join uh, our church today as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, even for the book of Revelation. That sometimes there's so many symbols and so many things going on. It seems confusing. But, Lord, help us to be patient and help us to study, to show ourselves approved unto you, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Lord, help us to read Genesis before we try Revelation. Help us to read the prophets before we try uh, to see the prophecy of John. Lord, help us to realize that most of these things in Revelation are not new. It's just they're coming to their fullness. And, Lord, we believe we see that day approaching. And Lord, if there's someone here that's never trusted Christ as their Savior to be their Redeemer, we pray, Lord, that they'll do that today. And for the other decisions that need to be made, uh, Lord, we pray that uh, the people will respond right now, whether they're here in the building or whether they're watching online. Lord, we pray that uh, you would work in hearts, do the work that only you can do today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now is our time of invitation. Our altar's open if you need to come. If you're watching online, uh, you'll see our number on the screen, so you'll be able to call and know that there's some folks here uh, who will be listening for your phone call. So let's stand together and sing a hymn of imitation. Won't you come? Let's sing together. I hear the Savior sing, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me my all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper's spots And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. 
Thank you for being here today, for your attention, for your prayers. Um, we're going to ask Brother Terry to come up and offer our final prayer, and then you'll be dismissed. I'll be staying up front, so if you've got something on your heart uh, that you want to talk about or pray about, I'll be up here for you. And uh, we'll pray that the Lord blesses you for coming here today. Brother Terry. All right, let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for this wonderful day that you've given us and how you've blessed us to be in your house to worship you today, to worship our Savior today, to worship and claim God and sing praises that we can, uh, we can claim. Thank you, God, we're able to sing when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Thank you, we can sing and redeemed how I love to proclaim that redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. God, we praise you today. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for these ministers that have shared with us and how you've blessed them this week in their studies. We pray for that. In the days ahead, we pray for our church and for the churches, all the churches that are lifting up the name of Jesus, even this morning. God, we pray for many to come to a saving knowledge and, and growth in Jesus Christ and, and the kingdom work that you've all called us to be. Lord, now bond and unify us together as we leave this place. Let us be the uh, service that you've called us to be. Let the others see Jesus in us as we live our lives, God, according to your will. And we're blessed to be in your presence again. In Christ's name I pray, amen.